Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first Northeast Networks uh, webinar series for uh, 2013 and 14. Today we'll be talking about embedding 21st century skills into after-school programming. Uh, my name is Ken Anthony. I'm the Director of Professional Development with the Connecticut After School Network and also a White Riley Peterson Fellow uh, for the past year. Uh, this is the first in a series provided by the Northeast Statewide After School Networks. There are eight networks that take part in this. Um, collectively and independently, we work to build partnerships and policies committed to the development and sustainability of after school programs uh, statewide. Uh, we've provided this webinar series over the past two years and try and do about one a month, uh, and you can contact your networks in your own state as far as the schedule and topics coming up uh, in the coming, coming months. We're able to offer this series through funding from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation uh, as part of the Pathways Out of Poverty portfolio. Uh, the Mott Foundation has worked to develop 42 statewide after-school networks across the country. We're also joined this morning by uh, Heather Lewicki and Alexis Menton from the Asia Society. Uh, the Asia Society is a nonprofit organization headquartered in New York with offices throughout the United States as well as the Asia Pacific region in Mumbai, Manila, Sydney, Hong Kong, and Seoul. The Asia Society works to develop globally competent youth prepared for college, work, and citizenship in an interconnected world. We also joined this morning by Lynn Stanley uh, from the New Hampshire after School Network. Uh, Lynn is the lead of the New Hampshire Network and uh, has a lot of good information she's going to share uh, as far as practice is concerned. So let's start our webinar this morning with a poll. Uh, if you could take a minute to submit uh, your answers to this, what does the term 21st century skills mean to you? You know, we hear this in literature, we hear this, um, you know, in the news, but what does it mean uh, to you personally in your practice or just in your thinking? So it looks like we have some media literacy, technology competency, skills to cope in the world today, incorporating the modern technology, uh, ability to think critically, problem solve. Uh, new techniques and terminology, reaching goals, skills and attributes students need. Uh, 21st century skills means the information age, collaboration, teamwork, global literacy, critical thinking. STEM, definitely. Uh, updated skill to keep up with what's becoming what's becoming available to you. Higher level executive functioning. Being safe, mindful, and competent, using learning about today's technology. So a lot of responses about technology. Getting necessary educational job readiness, life skills, and soft skills. Teaching and learning that combines a focus on student outcomes. We'll give folks another, another few seconds here. Skills needed for complex technology. Skills needed to succeed in a global economy. Critical thinking, collaboration, holistic learning, core subjects, technology, media, life, and career readiness. Take a couple more here. And hard and soft skills that are applicable to the types of job opportunities in the future. Absolutely. Well, thank you for taking part in that uh, in that poll. At uh, this time, I'm going to turn it over to Heather and Alexis uh, to talk about more of global competence and what that work looks like uh, with the Asia Society. So, Heather, Alexis. 
Great. Thanks, Ken. So um, a lot of what, this is Alexis, by the way. Um, I think Heather and I probably sound a bit alike, so we'll be sure to introduce ourselves. Um, so what Asia Society um, does is we work with schools and after-school programs to incorporate global competence across the curriculum. And what you all listed as some of the um, pieces or requirements or components of 21st century skills is really part and parcel of what we talk about when we talk about global competence. So this idea of thinking critically, um, problem solving, using technology, um, STEM and job readiness skills, um, this idea of both hard and soft skills. And I think somebody said it really well. Somebody wrote, skills to cope in the world today. And somebody else mentioned um, something about skills around um, an ever-changing world. So those are some of the big ideas that, that we address in global competence. And before we go further, we wanted to just give you some definitional statements to, to understand what we mean by those terms. So global competence is defined as the possession of the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to understand and act creatively on issues of global significance. So one of the things that's really important about this definition is that it does include core content academic knowledge as well as being able to apply that knowledge through 21st century skills and higher order thinking skills. But this work goes even further to say that dispositions are important, that we want young people to be able to have agency, to have voice, and to act um, and, and take action around uh, some of the critical issues that are important in our world today. So you may hear global competence referred to as global literacy or global citizenship, um, but that's, that's what we mean by global competence. When we talk about global learning, we talk about the act or process of acquiring global competence. So global learning is the process that, that students are engaged in and that we are engaged in as educators and youth workers to help young people achieve global competence. So you may hear global learning referred to as global education or international education. Um, that's essentially the same thing that we mean by global learning. So to segue a little bit to the connection with 21st century skills, um, we like to think about global competence as 21st century skills in a global context. So not only being able to acquire 21st century skills, but being able to apply them to the real world issues that affect us both locally and globally. So I'm just gonna go in a little bit more detail about um, what makes up global competence and what it looks like when students demonstrate it. Uh, Asia Society chaired a task force that was convened by the Council of Chief State School Officers um, that really broke down global competence into four key components. And um, those four are represented on this slide. I'm just gonna briefly go through them. But I think that you'll hear in these four domains a lot of the skills and um, habits and um, uh, uh, capacities that folks had listed in response to the poll that Ken asked. So global competence uh, requires the ability to investigate the world. And this means that young people are able to use a range of methods to identify, research, and frame globally significant questions that address important phenomena and events that are relevant, again, both locally and worldwide. This helps young people be able to analyze evidence, draw valid conclusions, and develop a position or an argument based on what they've learned about the world. The second domain is the ability to recognize perspectives. And this involves helping young people recognize and compare both their own perspectives as well as others and to understand how differential access to knowledge, information, technology, and resources um, can affect people's views. The third domain is the ability to communicate ideas. This means being able to effectively communicate in a variety of both verbal whether it's used or another language, being able to communicate with different and under audiences may perceive different meanings from the on their own. And then the four particularly relevant to after school and out of school programs, the ability for young So this is what I was talking about before, that people really need to see themselves as active bystanders stage and really be able to eat and take action on evidence and insight. Well, to take in needs and the different perspectives. 
to advocate for um, action that conditions globally. And then you'll see in the of, of this graphic, um, we have a, in the center, it talks about being able to understand the world through disciplinary and interdisciplinary st uh, study. And so this is important. We don't see global competence as something that students develop only in a geography class or a social studies class or a world history class, but through their endeavors in any subject area and any um, learning opportunity. So being able to think like historians or scientists or artists um, when they approach learning about the world and being able to acquire those skills and apply them to inter interdisciplinary challenges that face our planet, like climate change, the spread of disease, uh, conflict, and other issues like that. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Heather to talk a little bit about what this means for after-school programs, how to think about applying 21st century skills and global competence to the work that you do in your programming. So I'm noticing here that folks are writing in that the audio is going in and out, so I just wanted to stop and check in and see if people can hear or can, if, are you aware of this? Yeah, it sounded when Alexis was talking, it was fading in and out a little bit, um, but uh, I'm not sure if that's on on the speaker end uh, on, on, on your phone or if it's something with free conferencing. Um, it's clear now, so that seems to be seems to be okay. Okay, great. And I see that some folks are writing in to respond to let us know that it is clear. So do keep letting us know if, if for some reason we're breaking up or going in and out. Um, so we wanted to shift gears a little bit here. Now that we've defined some terms, global competence and global learning, and then broaden the perspective of what global competence looks like in young people through the four domains that Alexis just spoke about, we wanted to, to pose a question to you. Why is global competence important? And I think some of you already started to answer that question in the initial poll, so maybe focus on the second question we have posed here, and why should after-school programs help youth become globally competent? So it's great that we're talking about global competence, but why should people focus on global competence in after-school or expanded learning time programs? So we don't have this in as a, um, as a response survey, but if you could write in some ideas into the chat line, we'll be able to gather a few there. So take a couple of moments to brainstorm and write in a couple of ideas about how you feel after school programs should be involved with helping young people become globally competent. I'm not sure that the that there's there's issues with the audio again. I'm seeing the Oh, there we go. There we go. Some all right. So, just to reiterate in case it broke up, there's a question posed on the slide on your screen now. The one in white that says why should after school programs help youth become globally competent? If you just take a moment to jot down your ideas in the chat function. So, several people are saying cater to the students' interests or Global competence involves all aspects of life, so therefore it's important to us as well. It deals with giving young people resilience and approach to the future and helping them to stay engaged. Uh, schools maybe don't have enough time to uh, contribute to 21st century skills and global competence, so it's, it's our job as well. And uh, some people are still maybe thinking that after-school programs are situated to help with global competence in a way um, that supports their interpersonal and technological skills and awareness of other cultures. So again, because the audio broke up just a, a smidge before, um, I just want to go back and um, show the slide defining the terms. So global competence, if we define that as the possession of the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to understand and act creatively on issues of global significance. And we're defining that more specifically in four areas, investigating the world, recognizing perspectives, communicating ideas, and taking action. Then we're thinking about how after-school programs can be supportive in helping young people develop their global competencies. So 
we want to go in through a few ideas that we have that maybe uh, elaborate more on what several folks wrote in. So basically, it's important that young people develop global competence because we're all living in a rapidly changing world that's vastly different from the one in which our parents and their parents and teachers grew up. Economic, technological, and social changes are connecting people across the globe as never before in previous generations. So these changes call for a new approach in how we as educators and youth workers prepare young people for success in their lives and their future careers. In order to be successful in this global world, young people will need to expand their horizons, as we like to say, from thinking beyond just their immediate neighborhood to the world beyond. Globalization, obviously, is in driving demand when we think about the diverse and international workplaces and the global economy. One in five jobs is tied to international trade. And in order to be com globally competitive, Educated Americans must then be globally competent. 95% of the world's consumers live outside of the borders of the United States. 95%. So that means that basically the majority of the world's purchasing power is outside of our borders here in the United States. And that means that with new customers abroad, we can expand American companies' revenues and profitability and also increase employment opportunities here in our U.S. market. Even if a company isn't, uh, selling directly in the global marketplace, they are most likely connected to or supplying and working directly with another company that is. So expansion abroad leads to more jobs domestically, and that means we need globally competent workers. 52% of U.S. employers in a manpower project survey reported difficulty filling jobs at their companies. Due to a lack of experience, of workplace skills such as collaboration, critical thinking, and agility, some of those things that you all described earlier as being a, a part of 21st century skills. And these skills are critical to generate productivity and innovation. And yet employers are saying that they are having a hard time finding young people who have those skills when they're entering the workforce. Additionally, we obviously have changing demographics due to mobility issues and immigration that mean that our culture is diverse. So in order to get along with people in our places of work and in our communities, we need to be aware of other cultures and understand what those different cultures are about and demonstrate respect toward them. Additionally, as Alexis pointed to earlier with the take action piece of our definition of global competence, we are obviously in a world where we have national security issues and diplomacy and collaboration concerns when we're dealing with transnational issues. So if we need to get along with other countries in the world in order to have a peaceful um, world and to deal with international trade, but we also need to make sure we get along with other countries and other cultures when we're dealing with those transnational issues that Alexis was talking about before, like global warming or poverty or health care, issues that impact all of us. So why is it important? for after-school programs to think about global learning. So we broadly spoke about how global competence is important, but why should after-school programs do global learning? We believe that global learning is a college and career readiness approach in after-school. As Alexis said, it's a way to uh, demonstrate or build those 21st century skills. We just talked about how 21st century skills are important for all young people and therefore, Global competence is a core competence required in this day and age. So helping young people to become globally competent supports them in becoming highly skilled workers, as we've just talked about, but also active citizens and well-informed voters. Global learning, therefore, isn't just confined to a school environment, and it's an imperative uh, aspect of the work that we must do with young people in out-of-school and expanded learning time programs as well. I believe someone said in the poll earlier, right, that we can't uh, school can't cover uh, all topics that help young people to become globally competent and ready for college and career, and therefore out-of-school time programs really have um, the onus on us as well to help schools uh, prepare young people for a global economy and for a diverse cultural um, community. Global competence is especially critical for low-income and minority youth. Often we hear when Alexis and I are working with 
uh, programs or state networks in the field, we hear that sometimes there's pushback when this new idea of global competence and global learning comes up. Uh, well, if we've got young people who are low income or minority or special education youth and maybe their language skills are not up to par, their reading and math skills are not proficient yet, maybe we need to think about focusing on those skills first. And our argument is that global learning activities are critical for these low income and minority youth because helping young people to become globally competent supports them in becoming those highly skilled workers that they need uh, to compete for high paying jobs in this global economy. So they should have access to those kinds of activities and skills development as well. Global learning activities help youth also to look beyond their immediate surroundings and experiences. So when their horizons are expanded, they see different possibilities for their future. And in this way, global learning can help to address the opportunity and achievement gaps. Global learning um, also helps young people to better understand their interests, skills, and aptitudes, and it can increase those 21st century skills that everyone identified earlier in the poll, such as collaboration, technological and communication skills, and all of those other soft skills, that, as we call it, that are needed for the workplace. Out-of-school time programs, therefore, have um, community and business partnerships and scheduling flexibility and formats that also can help provide young people with these types of hands-on, real-world activities um, that maybe schools cannot address. And related to that, OST programs can um, serve teens uh, through career exploration, travel, college and work opportunities, and or looking at and exploring fields or countries of interest that they may not have had an opportunity to think about or study previously. So global learning and after school can also reinforce the school day content and learning objectives. We like to think of global learning as a way to operationalize the common core state standards because they focus on higher order thinking skills and learning through real, real world experiences. And, and uh, Ken is going to talk about that more directly in just a moment. But the last bullet that we wanted to address is that global competence is a priority for businesses and policymakers. We spoke about the business side uh, previously on the last slide, but we just wanted to point out to folks who may not already be aware that the U.S. Department of Education published its first international strategy last November, and the aims of that were twofold. One, to articulate ways to strengthen U.S. education, and second, to advance the country's international priorities. So we'd like to highlight that uh, the U.S. Department of Education has not only adopted our definition of global competence that Alexis reviewed earlier, but that this is becoming an imperative and a directive um, from the U.S. Department of Education for schools and educational programs alike to make sure that they have on um, their priority list. So with that in mind, uh, I'll hand it back to Ken to talk more specifically about how to think about global competence and global learning activities uh, in out-of-school time. Thanks, Heather. Uh, so looking at programs, you know, what do 21st century skills look like from a program development context? Uh, so there's a few steps, if I can flip the slide here, a few steps that programs can take to uh, begin to really think about uh, intentionality in, in what you're doing in programs. Uh, so mapping the learning opportunities that are occurring in your program, you know, looking at what you're offering on a daily basis, and are the lessons fillers or are they intentional in design and purpose? Um, and where are there opportunities to expand the learning? So how can these opportunities be expanded and contain deeper content? Uh, for example, cooking, environmental awareness, etc. And more importantly, have, have you asked staff and children or youth how they could make it better, you know, really allowing them to give their perspective. Um, part of that starts with, uh, one, with partnerships, you know, looking at the sense of partnership that you have with your school, if you're a community-based provider, or the connection between the school and out-of-school time. A nice way to do this is aligning your planning with common core thinking and standards. Uh, so how does what you're doing in after school connect to the classroom to expand learning opportunities that integrate teamwork, collaboration, and the habits of mind that engage core learning potential beyond the classroom into a more global context, and embedding the soft skills into program elements with an academic underpinning. 
So I talked a little bit about the, the Common Core uh, state standards. So let's just go really quickly on the vision of the Common Core. Um, so the standards are designed um, to uh, be robust, relevant to the real world. And I think that's the opportunity that we as after-school providers have, is that we are connected to the real world, that we can take the rigor of the classroom and put relevance in it through out-of-school time. Um, it provides a complementary learning environment um, that really can help make it seamless for the kids that they are getting a concept, reinforcing it in after school, and aha, you know, and it could be linked to global learning. Uh, we're going to talk in a little bit about some examples and some resources that we have um, that can really help move what you're doing now very easily into a global context and into something that aligns with the Common Core. So the primary vehicle uh, that we've used in Connecticut is um, using the habits of mind, you know, in thinking about here are these sort of underpinnings that um, that kids need to one actualize the um, the content of the Common Core, but two things that they're already doing in after school. So looking at these uh, seven habits of mind, um, the Common Core provides a bridge to help strengthen skills needed by children to achieve the mastery. Uh, so teamwork, open communication, youth voice allow them to question content or outcomes and to make the activity relevant but grounded in that in that context. And some examples, you know, looking at this when we talk about demonstrating independence, um, could be allowing spaces for youth to experiment with an art space or a science table, uh, allowing spaces for youth to lead with problem solving or leadership opportunities. Um, looking at building strong content knowledge could be talking about art and artists, uh, and that could take a global context as well. Cooking and math, sports and statistics, and youth interest areas. Um, other things, uh, looking at you know number four, for example, comprehend as well as critique. Build in checks for youth to comprehend. You know, if you're doing some sort of science-related uh, activity, a STEM activity after school, you know, allowing them to and make sure that they are understanding what they're engaged in and how is that relevant. Um, valuing evidence, using technology strategically and capably. Uh, I don't think that I've met any any kids in a program that don't know how to use technology strategically and capably all the way from kindergarten. And the last one, come to understand other perspectives and cultures. You know, linking back to those domains of global competence, investigating the world, communicating ideas, recognizing perspective, and taking action. Um, provide them, uh, provide the, the children and youth a way to deepen their learning and reinforce it uh, through the out-of-school time. One thing that we developed last year with the Asia Society uh, for the Connecticut After School Network uh, for our training around the Common Core was this alignment chart. That you can see those uh, seven habits of mind on the left side, demonstrating independence, building strong content knowledge, etc. And then the corresponding um, alignment between the domains of global competence. So investigating the world aligns with demonstrating independence uh, and so on. These um, have, have really been useful in creating these things called global quick sheets that Lynn is going to talk about in a few minutes um, in really taking what you're doing in after school and making it uh, meaningful, making it deeper learning, uh, and also giving a focus that's common core linked and also uh, incorporating global competence. So at this time, we're going to open another poll uh, and ask you all, what are you doing to embed 21st century skills into your program? Uh, so if you could take a minute and uh, submit your responses, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk more about the global quick sheets and how that, that looks like in your program. Starting getting responses and STEM initiatives. After school global concerns, clubs and curriculum for teachers. Leaders and training program, service learning in communities and schools. Math program online. Project based learning that uses group projects. 
And I think project-based learning, uh, that's a great point. Project-based learning is, a, is an excellent opportunity to embed these 21st century skills in having activities that are over a durational period. It really allows that learning to uh, kind of percolate and, and deepen. Civic engagement program, engaging in community service opportunities, art skills with literacy, Week lesson plans to include habits of mind, allowing children to use different aspects throughout the time. STEAM, STEAM being science, technology, arts, engineering, and math. Enrichment programming, which can be applied to real world applications. Robotics programs. Taking the interest is to building hands-on activities. And I think that's another key area is taking that student interest, that youth voice, and being able to uh, really give it not only a, uh, a global focus but also uh, an academic underpinning. Providing a summer camp at our local aquarium on marine science. We'll give a couple more responses and then we'll move on here. It's been very hard to get the children to think out of the box. Encouragement of shared thoughts and feelings with peers. And allow the kids to use iPads to play games. Give them a chance to free draw. Well, thank you so much for all your, your submissions. Um, you know, if you have any other uh, gems or ideas that you want to submit, you can feel free to use the chat box after the poll closes. You can still type them in the chat box as well. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn Stanley uh, from the New Hampshire After School Network uh, to talk more about what this looks like in your programs. Lynn? Hi, thanks, Ken. Um, this is Lynn, and... As Ken said, I'm the lead for the New Hampshire After School Network, and one of the things that Ken and I have been working on is uh, the handouts, well, you have some of the handouts that we've been working on, on how you can really operationalize this um, and be very intentional about embedding these, uh, the, the global learning into the activities that you're already doing. Um, it looks like from the responses that a number of you are being really thoughtful and planful about uh, the activities and the experiences that you're um, providing for the, the children in your programs. Um, but then when you look at your other activities and you say, oh, yeah, we do that. So it's going from that, oh, yeah, we do that, kind of as, as youth development workers almost instinctively uh, put these types of activities part of these uh, learning experiences into the activities that we're doing. But moving from that, oh, yeah, we, are, we do that, to being very intentional about what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, knowing that the skills that you're helping the children in your program develop are going to work for them later on down the road um, when they get to upper grades, when they get to college, when they're uh, in their careers. Um, much like we've, you know, over the past years been talking about intentionality around literacy skills and math skills and science skills, uh, the term soft skills gets, gets bantered around. But really when we're talking about these soft skills, we're talking about uh, global competencies. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about being able to work in a group, um, being able to think critically about about the, um, the things that you're doing. And uh, after-school programs are a fantastic place to do this learning because we're flexible, because we have the time, because um, in an after-school program, if the kids in your program say, hey, let's try this, 
you often have the flexibility and the the, the ability to, okay, let's try that, um, as opposed to, well, we need to get through this piece of, of information, we need to get through this piece of content, and then maybe we can think about doing something different later on. In after-school programs, you can, you can shift gears, and if nothing else, after-school uh, people are really good and really capable of shifting gears, and that those those times are really great opportunities to um, provide really great learning experiences. And children find after school fun. It's they are fun learning experiences. Uh, what I like to call learning in spite of themselves. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to ask a lot of questions and to be more of a facilitator and coach. And let's think about that some more um, rather than as an instructor. Oh, there, there's my slide. Um, so, so what does this all look like in, in programs? With the leadership opportunities, collaborating with peers, and intentional program design. Can't say the word intentional enough because it really is thinking about what what you're going to be doing and why you're doing it and, and being intentional about allowing flexibility. And if there's, hey, let's, let's think about this, there's interest there, go with that interest and, and be able to um, veer off your, off your course a little bit. Ken, I don't know if I have control over, oh, there we go. Um, just as a, a Really, um, I don't want to say basic, but a really concrete way of how you can embed global learning into your activities. Most uh, or many after school programs do cooking activities. It, kids love it, you get something out of it at the end. It's a great way to work as a group and, and Children are usually children are usually usually pretty focused on it and enjoy it a lot. Um, so how can you take something like cooking and and uh, be intentional about your global learning the same way that you've been intentional about your literacy skills? Oh, we're we're reading recipes. How are, and how you're intentional about your math skills? Oh, we have to double the recipe. We have to quadruple the recipe. Oh, we have to change it from metric to to um, cups and, and half cups and teaspoons. Um, and, and now thinking about cooking and how you're incorporating global learning. And an easy way to do this is to, is to, is to uh, have children explore foods from other cultures. Um, so, uh, you may have children in your program who have uh, from their own culture, traditional foods that they say, oh, we, we do this. Oh, let's try this in our after-school program. Um, and it can create a lot of conversation and, and move beyond just the actual act of cooking the food. Um, so if you have children research what foods and eating customs are in their country, this aligns with investigating the world. Um, this is uh, a fantastic way to have uh, children do some research. Okay, let's look this up. Uh, let's find out what kinds of foods uh, people eat in this country or in this part of the United States or in this part of the world. Um, what, and finding out why is this food popular? Um, is it where, where does this tradition come from? Where does this heritage come from? What crops are grown in that, uh, or that's also with explore how geography plays a role in the foods grown and eaten. Uh, and asking questions about what, why is it that this food is grown or produced in this country? Um, ask how similar or dissimilar it is to foods that they eat. It's getting children out of their comfort zones and uh, even incorporating a bit of that fear factor a bit. I know many programs uh, incorporate with some of their older students and try something new. 
Um, and then, and then actually having the children prepare the foods from that country so that they're doing that hands-on uh, piece. Within that actual cooking time, there's the, there are the other skills that they are, the global learning skills that they are learning, how to work as a group, uh, taking some leadership, being responsible for various aspects of the meal or the food that is being cooked. So that's a really concrete way that you can incorporate, intentionally incorporate global learning into, into an activity that, that many after school and summer programs do. If you look at the handouts that, uh, were, that came along with your meeting invitation, you can see that there's also, a, a quick sheet on uh, garden transitions. And then there is a city planning guide so that you can, at the activity, your program, how are they investigating the world, how are they recognizing perspectives, so at this point, Ken, I'm going to some time for slide. About the activities that providing, how they might, how you might incorporate activities. Join. Oh, is the audio breaking up again? Yeah, you, you, we lost you for a second. Are, are you back? Oh, I was lost. I'm sorry. Okay. There you go. You're um, back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was gone until I, I started looking at the chat questions. Okay. Then at this point. If uh, you're just looking at the time, let's uh, maybe open up to some questions about anything that's been presented or how uh, maybe a bit of a conversation about other activities that you are already providing and how you might incorporate global learning into the activities that you're already doing. And, and I can answer a few questions right off the bat uh, that folks have here about the PowerPoint and also the, uh, the handouts that Lynn was talking about. Um, the PowerPoint, uh, the presentation will be available um, by uh, within a few, the next few weeks um, for your statewide after school networks. Um, so in your own individual states, if you contact your network uh, or just keep an eye on their website, um, they uh, will have that, uh, this presentation up with the PowerPoint and also the audio. Um, the other piece is for the uh, global quick sheets that we were talking about. Um, they will be uh, available. I'm going to go in after this webinar and make sure all the participants are emailed um, the global quick sheets that Lynn was talking about as well. Uh, yeah. So our first question here says, what would be a good activity for first graders with no access to a kitchen? Yeah. Um that's that's great. I mean we use cooking because that is an activity that that many many after school programs and summer programs uh, do do. However, if you don't have a kitchen, then it's probably not part of your curriculum. There, and I would recommend looking at some of the the quick sheets because maybe you do all. I mean you do already do uh, transition games, indoor games, outdoor games. Uh, and then it's looking at that uh, planning, the activity planning, and really breaking down what it is that you do and how you can incorporate some of those those global learning uh, skills and competencies. So if you think about the the games that you play, how are you uh, giving leadership opportunities? Are you looking at uh, games that are played in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. 
why is it that those games are are popular? Uh, what are the resources that they have? Um, how similar or dissimilar is it to the games that they play? Um, so, I mean, cooking, cooking is a concrete example for one type of activity, but you can really look at all of your activities and how global learning can be a, a part of it. Was that Alexis who was breaking in? Yeah, sorry. I was just going to add also that um, you know, cooking is certainly a great activity for a variety of reasons, but you can also think about the global connections to food in general. Um, we were just actually out uh, presenting at a conference in Seattle, and somebody gave the example that they asked their group of elementary students, I'm not sure what age, um, where bananas come from, and one of the children said Safeway, right, the supermarket. So it's an opportunity for them to talk about, um, you know, where foods are grown around the world, how they get to the supermarket, and um, how we eventually get them here in our own local communities. So even though it's not a cooking activity, there's ways that you can address um, food from around the world that may not involve, you know, big productions and uh, cooking of meals. So that's just something to think about as you're considering those types of activities. And I think people are actually adding in the chat box some good suggestions and examples of, of ways to do it as well, which is great. No, I would just add, this is Heather, think about that, that take action piece here too. So when Lynn, I'm going to move back in slides here, when, whoops, went too far. When Lynn was talking about how some of the activities that she brainstormed here, how they aligned with the domains of global competence, Think about how it can, how one idea can spark a whole theme or unit. So, for example, have children prepare foods from that country. You can think about it thematically. For example, one example I like to use is is around um, sandwiches. For example, so how do different cultures view sandwiches? So, is it a po' boy from the south? Is it a taco? Is it uh, a pita, stuffed pita? So you can think about how to, when we talk about either project-based learning or thematic planning as a way to develop a unit plan rather than a one-off lesson for young people, you can organize a six-week cooking curricula around that and embed not only the investigation part in the research of the different cultures, but then the link to the global issues like Alexis was talking about, um, health and nutrition around the world. That can then spark a take action or a project-based or service learning piece around, say, soup kitchens and how they're run. Um, and so if you don't have a cooking club, because I think many, many locations don't, right? You don't have access to a kitchen or you, you're not necessarily um, have a full-blown stove or oven where you want to do cooking with people, but you can think about cooking in the broader sense of food and how food is um, looked at and viewed around the world, food scarcity issues, and that can spark different kinds of action projects depending upon the age of your young people. So think about the, the quick sheets that, that Lynn and Ken are sending out to you as ways to just spark ideas even if you don't already make a space for cooking or STEM or field trips or outdoor games. There might be other things your program has the capacity to do that these can just help you with generating ideas around the four domains and just brainstorming with your colleagues. Yeah, and this, is Lynn, this is Lynn again. And uh, it, even if you got completely away from food, thinking about uh, the difference, I mean, as most people know, the difference between a community service project and a service learning project really is about the work that goes before you actually do the community service. The service learning is about learning what it is uh, behind the issue that needs to be addressed. So when you give children and young people the opportunity to think about why this is an issue on a local level and then doing something about it on a local level, that also gives you the opportunity to talk about how this might be an issue in other places uh, in the state, in the country, and in other countries and around the world. Um, so it really is about sparking that conversa those conversations about why things are and exploring uh, reasons and, and, and doing some of that critical thinking around why, why things are and how they are a part of it. 
Somebody also just wrote into the chat and reminded me that um, not everyone can see what's in the chat box. So several folks in the chat box have suggested um, thinking about ways to involve cooking that don't involve a kitchen, like making trail mix or make, using even a hot plate or you know some ways that you can um, start to do some cooking without a full uh, fully supplied kitchen. And then others are suggesting thinking about visiting local restaurants, ethnic restaurants, um, visiting local farms to introduce uh, children to different foods and how our foods are similar um, and dissimilar to other countries. Um, some people are talking about um, even looking at different food pyramids and what are the staple foods in different cultures and how that looks compared to ours. Um, so there's a, a variety of different ways that you can tackle this particular example um, around cooking. Somebody also asked a question um, about, let me find it, um, we're doing an Around the World for Thanksgiving, and we're looking at the things that they produce in their economy. Do we need to include every subject, or can we focus on one in each country? And if I'm understanding this question correctly, I think, um, and, and this I think is an important question because I think sometimes uh, starting with global learning can seem overwhelming. There's so many countries around the world, there's so many different cultures, there's so many different subject areas, whether it's math or English or other areas that we want to include into our activities, and how do we start? And I would certainly encourage you to focus in on one subject, uh, one country, and around the world is a way to bring in lots of different pieces um, and to give kids a ex wide exposure to a variety of countries and cultures. Um, but that type of activity is a great introductory or preliminary activity to, to figure out what your students are most interested in, what piques their curiosity, what connects with some of the things that they want to learn and that they need to learn, and then use that as an opportunity or an entry point to go deeper. So if you're doing it around the world, um, you can be you know, focusing on a variety of different countries and cultures or even subject areas, but then as a follow-on or an extension to that activity, you can really narrow in on and say, okay, let's look even deeper. We've learned about the foods from this country, let's learn about other things from that country as well. And maybe we learned about and, and practiced our math skills while we were doing cooking, but now here's an opportunity to write a reflection on what we learned, and so we're also building um, students' ELA skills as well. So there's different ways to, um, to think about it, and sometimes it can seem like we need to be doing everything all at once. Um, that's certainly an approach, again, to give that wide exposure, but it's really important to focus on what Lynn was talking about, about being intentional. What are the specific uh, countries, cultures, issues, topics, that most interest your students and that provide opportunities for you to be imparting some of the specific, whether it's literacy, math, science, or other skills that your students need. I think, Alexis, on that point as well, you know, looking at, um, you know, I know today we talked about global learning and cooking, you know, as our example, uh, but there's there's a lot of crossover that folks can do as far as, you know, looking at, at some of the other quick sheets that were in the attachment that I'm going to send out. Uh, environmental awareness, geopolitical landscape, that these things really lend themselves to broader conversations about, you know, we're talking about cooking, but maybe we can also relate this to what happens when, you know, the rainforest gets cut down in other countries, what happens when uh, there's a water supply shortage because one country controls the water into another country. Um, so I think there's a lot of fruit for conversations as doing something that, you know, a lot of programs do, a cooking activity that can expand into other areas that are going to deepen that learning and really help with the critical thinking skills, those 21st century skills that we talked about earlier in the webinar, uh, to really embed those concepts into programming. Is anybody there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I think one of the, this is Lynn again, I, I think one of the key things to keep in mind is you, you, can't, you can't do everything, mm -hmm. but you can really get that student voice about what interests them. They have questions. You know they are constantly asking you questions, and you don't need to have all of the answers. Part of global learning is giving students, giving children and youth the tools and resources to be able to discover some of those answers on their own. 
and providing them the venue and the opportunity to say, that's a really great question. Maybe we should learn more about this. What do other people think about this? What are some of the different points of view? Are we, are we all in agreement? Are we, do we look at the world differently? How might other people look at this? Um, and you can, you can do that with, I, I think I could argue, every activity that you do, whether it's art or cooking or outdoor games or indoor games or uh, short story writing or even sitting down and listening to, to uh, an adult read to them. There are questions that come up, and you can provide the opportunities for them to explore it more. And I'm looking at the time saying, oh, Ken, we're getting really close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Lynn, <laughs> I think very well said and, and actually a great summary of, of what we've talked about. So thank you. So let's see. All right, so here's our, here's our last slide. Um, so with the time, uh, I guess... Um, we will wrap it up for today, um, but you know this this is only the beginning of a conversation. Um, so you know uh, our contact information is on this slide. If after the webinar uh, is over, you have thoughts or ideas or questions, um, we're always looking for examples from programs. Um, you know that we can say here's the, here's something that a program is doing uh, and point folks to give them sort of a jumping off point. Uh, so please don't hesitate to contact us um, and thank you for taking part today and we appreciate your time. Thank you everyone and thank you Ken and Lynn for organizing the webinar. Thanks Alexis and Heather and Lynn for, for being on. Thank Have you. Have a good day all. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Bye. Halloween everybody. <laughs> Happy Bye. Halloween. <laughs>